Next stop will be my Yuval Ramani on uh, reordering buffers. Uh, thank you. Okay, so um, this is the reordering buffer management uh, problem. Uh, we have an input stream of uh, balls of various colors. And uh, we have a buffer that has uh, some fixed capacity k, and in this example, uh, k equals 3. Uh, the balls, as they arrive, uh, enter the buffer. And then, of course, at some point, the buffer becomes full. And in order to uh, be able to process the next input item, you have to remove one of the balls uh, that are currently in the buffer. And uh, the order by which they enter the buffer does not matter. So, so you can choose any one of these three balls to remove now. Uh, for instance, uh, the green ball. And then a new uh, input item enters the buffer. And now you have to remove some other um, ball. And, and you keep doing this uh, until uh, the entire input sequence is uh, exhausted. And then you just have to clear the buffer. So, so the final steps are just uh, clearing the buffer of all the remaining balls. Uh, so this is how you produce uh, the output. So, so the output is some permutation of the input, but it's not an arbitrary permu permutation. It's a permutation that can be realized by a buffer of size k. Um, now, um, uh, so, so that's the input and the up output. What is the objective? Uh, the objective is to minimize the context switching cost of the output sequence. And in this uh, specific case that we will talk about for uh, most of the talk, uh, the context switching cost is simply one whenever we change colors. So, so this particular um, uh, solution uh, costs five because there are uh, five uh, color uh, blocks in the output. Uh, th this isn't the optimal solution. The optimal solution in this case is four, and our mistake was actually the uh, removing uh, uh, the green ball as, as our first move. Uh, if we would have delayed that, we would have had uh, only four uh, color batches. Uh, so here's a list of excuses why to study this problem. Uh, uh, they're not that interesting um, uh, for us right now. Uh, uh, for me, uh, perhaps the last one is the most uh, uh, interesting. So uh, I think this problem reveals uh, some fascinating uh, facets of online computing, uh, and therefore it's an appealing model to study. And of course, you can produce slides with uh, uh, colorful and joyful photos. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so uh, in the next two slides, I'm going to summarize everything that's known about this problem right now, uh, hopefully. Um, first of all, in the offline setting, uh, so, so, uh, so we know the entire input uh, sequence in advance. Uh, and uh, we want to compute an optimal scheduling of removing stuff from the buffer. Uh, the problem is known to be NP-hard. There are at least two proofs of that, and at least one of them is also correct, most likely. Um, and there is a uh, constant factor approximation. Uh, the uh, initial constant by uh, uh, Vigdor Gabli and myself uh, was, I think, something a little bit less than 135, uh, and that was improved uh, more uh, to 60, so, so about half of that, 60-something. So, so that's the best uh, constant that's currently known. Uh, in the online setting, um, so, so, so there are no hardness results. I mean, it's not known to be APX uh, uh, hard or anything like that. Uh, in the online setting, um, uh, in fact, um, uh, things uh, are uh, much better due to uh, a lot of work by many people, uh, uh, including Anna, who is uh, right here uh, with us. Uh, so, so there is a, um, a deterministic upper bound of square root of log k, uh, competitive ratio, and that's nearly matched by a deterministic lower bound of square root of log k over log log k. So there's a small gap there. 
Uh, in the uh, randomized case, uh, the bounds are asymptotically tight, so other than the co leading constant, we know everything. There is an order log log k randomized algorithm, uh, and that's matched by uh, uh, previously known omega log log k uh, lower bound on the competitive ratio. I'm sorry? K, what K is? K is the size of the buffer. K is the size of the buffer. Now, uh, uh, we talked about uh, this very simple uh, uniform context switching cost where uh, changing to a different color just costs one whenever, whenever it's done in the output. There are more sophisticated um, uh, uh, context switching uh, cost models. Uh, so perhaps the next simplest one is uh, the case of non-uniform costs. In non-uniform costs, uh, uh, each color has a different cost. So if I switch to green, I'll pay something. If I switch to blue, I'll pay something else. Uh, and um, uh, there, uh, the uh, picture is somewhat murkier. Uh, so almost all the results uh, include a, a term uh, that depends on the uh, maximum ratio of the costs. And of course, the maximum ratio of the cost could be arbitrarily large. In this model, um, uh, so uh, uh, so it, it need not give us anything uh, uh, that depends only on k. Uh, so here is what's known: there is an approximation uh, algorithm, uh, triple log of this gamma times k. Um, there is a square root of log gamma k upper bound on the deterministic competitive ratio. Uh, the only uh, bound that uh, does not depend on this gamma is this bound, uh, order log k over log log k. So, so that's the only thing that we know that doesn't depend on the, uh, on, on the weights themselves. And uh, there's also a log log gamma k squared uh, randomized uh, algorithm. Uh, that's known. Uh, so, so yeah. Excuse me, a little question. In the star metric, no? so if you are on, on color green and you go to red, yeah. do you weigh the green again? And to, um, and so it, it, do, it doesn't really matter, right? It's just a factor of two. Yeah. So, uh, so, so you could, uh, so, so the star metric is not exactly identical to the non-uniform costs model because in the non-uniform costs model, you're only paying the weight of the color you're switching to. But you can define a star where uh, you know e each of the colors has half the weight of of, of their actual weight, uh, and then you're paying for moving into the color and for moving out of the color. Each one is you pay half. So so that's the same up to an additive term. Um, no, there, there are more general uh, cost uh, functions. So you, you can induce a, a metric on the colors. Uh, and, and then even less is known. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of work on this, uh, or some work on this, uh, uh, and some progress. Uh, but uh, you, you see the, um, uh, I won't go over the results. I'm afraid I might not have enough time. Uh, uh, the, the one thing to uh, uh, know, uh, one, one important and very simple fact to know, is that if you do not change the input sequence at all, so you just output the input sequence, you don't actually need the buffer for that, right? You need a buffer of size one. You're not even using the buffer except for one uh, position. Uh, uh, the input sequence is uh, no worse than 2k minus one times the optimal solution. So there is a bound here on how bad you can uh, do, uh, and it's a bound in terms of k alone, whereas all of these results do not depend just on k. So, uh, so we don't know uh, if, if, the, if there's something better than linear in k, uh, which depends only on k. Then there are other models. Uh, uh, there's the block devices model, which is a slight variation of this. Uh, in, in fact, uh, um, uh, this result of Adamacek et al., uh, one of the ingredients of what I'll show you here borrows heavily from that paper. Uh, it's, it's a variation where when you remove a color, you only remove the stuff that's currently in the buffer, and you can't append to it new items of the same color that are arriving while you're removing it. So that's the difference. It makes a, a, a rather significant difference in, 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 what, what you, um, in how uh, you need to solve the problem. 
uh, but uh, uh, the work on that actually is useful also for the uh, reordering buffer but problem. What is C? C, uh, C is the set of colors. Sorry, I, I didn't mention that. C is just a set of colors. Oh, okay. So it's K. No, it's not K. K is the size of the buffer. OK, so I want to talk about linear programming relaxations because we're supposed to be all about uh, continuous optimization here. Uh, so here is a linear programming relaxation for uh, the uh, uniform reordering buffer uh, problem. And if it's non-uniform, you just have to plug in the weights here. Uh, so it just changes the objective function. Uh, so what does the uh, LP uh, um, uh, represent? Uh, Xij in the integer version of this is an indicator variable uh, that says that item i is removed at output slot j. So, so, uh, so the output sequence, uh, 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 the input sequence starts at slot one and goes all the way to slot n, and the output sequence starts at slot k plus one, because the first k uh, uh, steps uh, are just uh, the initial k items entering the buffer, and it ends at uh, slot k plus n. Uh, uh, so, and xij is the in, is is the indicator, or in the in the LP solution, it's the fraction of item i that is removed at at output slot j. And then we have uh, two obvious sets of constraints. So, uh, every item has to be removed uh, at some point. So, so this is the first set of constraints. And uh, uh, the second set of constraints is that uh, at every time step, we cannot remove more than one item. Uh, so these are two obvious uh, constraints. This is a somewhat less obvious uh, uh, set of constraints. Uh, this set of constraints is necessary in order to be able to uh, express the objective function in terms of these uh, xij's. And uh, intuitively, what the set of constraints uh, does, uh, we will soon get rid of it but, and, and, and have a different representation. But what the, the set of constraints says is um, that uh, if you um, remove uh, an item i at step j, where the next item of the set of the same color is already available, then you're also going to remove that next item. So, it, so, so this constraint doesn't allow you to uh, uh, cut uh, sequences of the same color if they can be continued. And of course, uh, an optimal solution would have that property. There's no reason to change uh, the context if you can continue with the same color. Uh, so this is a, uh, a pictorial uh, view of, uh, of how the fractional solution looks like, uh, or at least uh, one way that you can express it. Uh, uh, you can think of it as, uh, um, as, I'm sorry? Was it obvious that the objective was? Uh... Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it will become even more obvious now. So uh, that, that's why I'm not going into it. Um, so, so the way to think about uh, the fractional solution as, is as follows. Uh, think of, uh, uh, here's the timeline. And, and you know, our schedule starts at time k plus one and ends at time k plus n. So, so these are, uh, I mean, it looks continuous, but what I mean is a discrete timeline. And uh, we have these, uh, uh, what we call batches. So a batch ij, or a blue batch ij, is just a sequence i of consecutive blue items, consecutive in the input sequence, that are removed starting from uh, slot j. So, so j indicates the initial time slot uh, where these are removed. And uh, uh, the LP just computes a fractional packing of, uh, of, of these uh, batches. So each batch here has a height. I mean, the total height is one, uh, because in every time unit, one item is removed. And each batch has a height corresponding to its weight in the packing. Uh, an integer solution is just uh, a packing of integral uh, batches instead of fractional batches. So this, how, this is how an integer solution uh, would look like. And this leads us to uh, the following equivalent formulation. So here, instead of uh, the xij's, we will have x capital ij variables. 
and X capital IJ uh, uh, simply indicates the, uh, the, the weight at which uh, the batch IJ is packed in the packing. So, so, so now the objective function is clear, right? Because we're just summing uh, uh, the total weight of all the batches that we're scheduling. Uh, and the constraints are also obvious. Uh, uh, every item has to be removed uh, at least once. So the sum of weights of all the batches that contain a certain item has to be at least one. And in every time slot, if I look at all the batches that use that time slot, their total weight has to be at most one. And of course, because of the indexing, uh, both of these in, in, in any feasible solution will be equations and not inequalities. You are? Yes. What, what is like a batch, a capital I? What is really uh, capital it's, it's, it's a sequence of consecutive items of the same color that are removed starting at, in, in slot J. So I indicates the sequence, and J indicates the starting uh, output slot for that sequence. So there's an I for every subsequence of, of items of the same. Yeah, but there's only a polynomial number of them, right? Because they're consecutive, so 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 they have a starting point and an end point, and that determines the whole sequence. Yeah, it's not a subset. Yeah, I what, what I does I range over? Yeah. I, I range is over starting and finish uh, positions of, of the items in the batch. Uh, the, uh, so, so this is the dual program. The dual program is also uh, pretty simple. Uh, we have uh, variables y, i for all the input uh, uh, positions and variables z, j for all the output p positions. And uh, I'm missing something. There might be boards that are not consecutive of the same column that are not consecutive in the input that you might still be able to put consecutive in the output. Yeah, yes, I, by consecutive I mean uh, when you look at this particular color, no, they, 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 there's no okay. missing ball in, the, in that range. That's what I meant yeah. by consecutive. Not, not that they come one after the other. Okay. Uh, there there so could be other balls of other colors in, in the middle. Only one for each of them. Yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, so, so the constraints here that if I look at the, uh, if I look at any batch, I sum the yi's over all the items there, and I sum the zj's uh, over all uh, the positions where these items are removed by this particular batch, this has to be bounded by one. Um, okay. So, uh, so, so let's uh, do some things with uh, this LP. I mean, we have an LP, so it could be good, it could be bad. Uh, here is one uh, very simple thing we can uh, do with it. Uh, let's consider the following, so, so, so this is now the offline world for now. Let's consider uh, the following rounding procedure. Um, so so I, I'm doing the rounding by uh, going over the time index. So, so, so I'm looking at the first time index where nothing is being removed and I have to fill that up. So I'm going, I, I'll look at my buffer. If there exists in the buffer um, an item uh, that has a LP weight at most a half, so that means that the LP removed this item with weight at least a half. I'm going to evict this entire color from the buffer and of course everything that can be appended to that while we're removing it. And otherwise we just keep accumulating items in the buffer. So no item is an interval or it's one item? No, it's, it's, it's one item but, but the item determines an entire sequence of items that will be removed. Uh, if, if there is one specific item that, that has weight less than a half, I will remove the entire color. Okay? Now, uh, of course, the cost of, of, uh, of, of my solution increases by a factor of at most two. I mean, this requires some proof, but, but you can show that. Uh, and on the other hand, what's the size of the buffer that I need to store all, uh, all, all the items, because sometimes I have no item that has weight less than a half in the LP. So the point is that uh, uh, at every point in time, every item in, the buff in my buffer has weight at least a half in the LP. And since the LP constrains uh, indirectly the uh, capacity of the buffer to be K, I can accommodate all these uh, uh, items with a buffer of size 2K. Yes? Can you show again the LP? How does it constrain it to be at most? 
Ah, I knew you would ask that. Uh, it constrains it indirectly by uh, setting the first time slot where an item is removed to be k plus one. That, that, that's where the buffer capacity is determined. Because I, I, I have to remove all of these items and I have exactly n positions to remove them, so I must remove one item in every position and that uh, maintains the capacity of the buffer. So, so, so I can accommodate all of this with a buffer of size 2k. So, so in fact, if I really want to solve the k buffer, I, I need to solve the LP for a buffer of size k over two and then do this rounding. Now, what do I pay for that? Well, if, if, uh, if I'm solving the LP for a smaller buffer, I might get uh, uh, a cost which is much higher than the optimal cost for a buffer of size k. Uh, but there is a, a result of uh, Englert and Westermann uh, that shows that uh, if um, uh, it's not for a factor of two, it's for a factor of four, it shows that uh, uh, the optimal solution for a buffer of size k is at most order of log k times the optimal solution for a, for a buffer that is four times as large. So that's also true for a buffer that's at least, uh, that's twice as large, right? That's a smaller buffer. So I'm, I'm not, uh, th and, and this log k is tight for, for the factor four. We, we don't really know the truth for uh, factor two. Um, so, so in fact, uh, this thing gives you a log k uh, approximation algorithm and also a uh, log k integrality gap for uh, the LP. Uh, now there are much better results, the, uh, the integrality gap and, uh, and, and uh, there's a constant uh, approximation algorithm in integrality gap. Um, it's not, uh, we don't know that for non-uniform costs, but for uniform costs uh, that's known. Uh, um, I don't think I'll have time to show that, but um, uh, let's see. So, so l let's, talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, online algorithms. So here's a very simple online algorithm. Um, I, hope, I hope I'll be able to show a little bit more than this. Uh, uh, so so uh, think of it as follows. Uh, every item has a penalty counter uh, and uh, uh, I look at all the items in my buffer and uh, so, so, so the items uh, just accumulate uh, these penalties until they are evicted from the buffer. So I, I take all the items in my buffer and I raise their penalties uniformly and continuously. Uh, of course, uh, you'd need to discretize that in order to uh, get an actual algorithm. Now, uh, as soon as I have a, a, a color in my buffer that has total penalty equal to one, I evict that color from the buffer. So that includes all the items that accumulated this penalty of one and possibly additional items that will enter the buffer as I'm removing uh, those items. So, so this uh, very simple algorithm is, uh, uh, can be shown to be log k over log log k competitive even for non-uniform costs. So for non-uniform costs, uh, the penalty has to reach the uh, cost of the color, not one. Uh, and the proof is, uh, in fact, uses um, uh, the LP. Uh, it uses the LP, of course, the algorithm doesn't use the, the LP, but the proof uses the LP by constructing a dual solution that bounds uh, the cost of the algorithm. And, and the dual solution is very simple. The proof that um, this is a feasible solution is the part that's non-trivial uh, in this result. So here is the um, uh, dual solution. Uh, ZJ, the Z ZJs, remember, the, these correspond to output slots. They just uh, grow monotonically and ZJ indicates the total penalty accumulated per item up to, uh, 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 up to slot J. So, so this is sort of a global uh, counter of, of this uh, uh, continuous process that we're doing. And YI is set when I is removed. It's set to, it's set uh, in a way that YI minus Z of the slot where I is removed is equal to uh, the total penalty that I accumulated divided by the approximation factor. And this is a feasible, so, so, so the, 
The hard part here is to prove that this is a feasible solution. Once you have this as a feasible solution, uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, th th then you get the approximation guarantee. Uh, another thing that you can show, uh, and this is somewhat important, uh, is, is the following thing. Th this algorithm, uh, again, by dual fitting, uh, is not, if, if, uh, if all the color blocks are large, the algorithm performs very well. So, so if, if all the removed color blocks are large, uh, if they all have size at least s, uh, the algorithm will be order log k over s competitive. And this might not uh, necessarily be tight for all s. Um, but, so yeah. S is, is, is a parameter of the output, right? S is a parameter of the output. So, so if, if you happen to be lucky, and uh, this is what happened, then you know that your algorithm performed well. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, let me do this very quickly. So, um, <laughs> I won't go over any of these details. Uh, so, uh, so, sort of uh, uh, ever since uh, Niv and Sefi uh, did a lot of work on online algorithms, uh, the obvious tool to use is uh, the primal dual schema. And in fact, uh, uh, Anna and uh, her uh, co-authors did just that for the block devices uh, uh, problem. Uh, and here uh, we're borrowing rather heavily from that. So, uh, um, so, so I just wanted to point out there are two major problems in applying the primal dual schema to uh, this uh, uh, formulation. Uh, the first problem is that uh, the primal has both uh, covering and packing constraints. So, so normally the primal dual schema applies when you have a covering problem or when you have a, a pure packing problem, and here they're mixed. And uh, what happens when they're mixed is that the dual has uh, negative signs, and, and, and that's an annoying thing for the primal dual schema because um, uh, it causes uh, problems. Uh, so it turns out that uh, uh, you can do things. Uh, the other problem is that um, uh, when you uh, raise uh, a primal variable, it doesn't uh, determine a decision just for the current time slot, but it determines decisions for future time slots because you're, you're scheduling a batch, you're not scheduling an individual item. And that also causes uh, various problems. Um, I won't, I, I don't have time to go over this, but let me just uh, explain one little thing here. So. Um, uh, the solution to uh, all of our problems uh, is the following. So, so first of all, uh, we're going to raise uh, some of the yi and some of the zj's uh, variables simultaneously. So we're raising both the yi's and the zj's. We're raising all the yi's that are still not fully scheduled. So that includes all the ones that are in the buffer and all the future ones. And we're raising all the zj's starting from the current position. Now, um, uh, the dual uh, increase rate is going to be the number of items that are still present in the buffer minus the capacity of the buffer. And this is a problem because the number of items in the buffer could be exactly the capacity of the buffer. Right, so that could be zero and that's bad because uh, we're not gaining anything in the dual. The uh, solution to this is a resource augmentation algorithm, uh, uh, sorry, is a resource augmentation uh, argument where uh, you actually compete against a dual that is using a slightly smaller buffer. So you're, you're, you're using a buffer of size k minus uh, k over log k instead of k. And this gives you some slack here. And this slack is good enough if uh, the, uh, batches that you're removing are small, are at most k over log k. Okay, so we have an algorithm that's good if all the batches are big. If all the batches are at least k over log k, we get log log k. If all the batches are below k over log k, we, 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 this argument leads also to a log log k. So we need to combine these two things. 
And that's actually the biggest difficulty here, how to combine these two arguments into one. Uh, and I won't explain that, uh, uh, ju just um, uh, what is the essence of the problem here? When you start accumulating a color in the buffer, you have no idea if it's going to be big or small when you will remove it. So you need some mechanism that will, de that will decide if it's going to be big or small. And of course, you can't just guess because then uh, your guess might be wrong and the whole, ar and, and the whole algorithm won't work. So, so there is some complicated mechanism that needs to be used, uh, uh, freezing some of the items and waiting to see if they accumulate and then releasing them. All this is a big mess, so I won't go into this. Uh, just to conclude, uh, here are some open problems. Uh, so uh, the, non -uniform, the uniform case is, is almost completely uh, uh, resolved. Uh, you know, except for this uh, deterministic uh, gap, uh, small gap, uh, that seems uh, pretty hard to close. Uh, but um, uh, some, uh, one, one remaining question is the approximability of the problem. So can we find uh, uh, an approximation algorithm that has a small constant, not something like 60 something? And uh, a PTAS is not excluded by anything that we know, so uh, this problem might as well have a PTAS. Um, then uh, in the non-uniform costs case, uh, my um, uh, belief is that uh, these should be the same bounds as in the uniform case, but right now uh, this seems pretty hard. The problem there is, is that all the strong arguments um, charge uh, certain colors on other colors. And if they don't have the same weights, this charging is a difficult thing. Uh, it involves uh, uh, packing, uh, you know, uh, uh, charging many small, uh, many low weight uh, colors on one big weight color or something, and that's hard to do. So, so that's the, the difficulty there. And then in general metrics, of course, any little O of K um, guarantee is interesting. Uh, both online and offline. So, so, so we don't know any approximation algorithm better than the online algorithms for general metrics. Uh, any LP relaxation for the problem, it's, it, it seems like a, a challenging uh, uh, thing to come up with or, you know, SDP relaxation or whatever uh, interesting tool uh, can be developed. Uh, and there are no approximation algorithms that are not derived from the online uh, algorithms. So that's it. One quick question. So you, you had this one point that you didn't talk about limited extra memory. Um, is it consistent with, would it be contradict anything we know so far to say that a constant factor extra buffers and a constant uh, performance care, competitive, you know, do, doing with the yeah, yeah, Yes, there, there, there is this lower bound, right? I, I actually mentioned it. Um, log in, and since that's, 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 yeah. that shows a bigger gap than you actually can achieve. So it's not clear that by doing the constant. <laughs> If, if, you, if the uh, smaller buffer is uh, k over 4, you have to pay a logarithmic factor for that. So there are sequences where the smaller buffer will cost uh, log k times the bigger buffer. Right, but that's, 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 I'm saying I, I want to measure performance oh. as a constant factor times the optimal, but not the true optimal, the constant factor for a constant factor smaller buffer. Oh, oh, no, no, no nothing, so no, 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 nothing will, not, in fact, uh, there might even be such results. I didn't mention the results that, that actually compare buffers of different sizes. Uh, yeah, so, so there, there's nothing that would, uh, of, in, in fact, that's how one of the earlier results works. It, it gives a constant factor competitive ratio against a, a, a buffer that is one quarter the, the buffer that you uh, want. Okay, I didn't understand the question. Okay, thank you all. Speaker of the day will be you, uh, who's that, Simons? Thank you. Um, 